to the week of May the 4th for ELA 7, Lesson 2. In this lesson, we will introduce the theme of Unit 4, Consumerism, and explore how authors share their perspective on this topic. So first of all, what is consumerism? Hopefully, when you look at this word, you see the word consume. There are many uses and definitions for the word consume. Most of them deal with the idea of taking something in or using something up. You can consume food by eating it. You can consume resources by using them. In this case, we are thinking of consume in the economic sense, when we buy goods or products. Consumerism, then, is the theory or the idea that consuming or buying is good and necessary for the society. As you can imagine, there are many ideas about whether or not consumerism is a good thing. Let's take a look at the Stream to Start video from Collections to get us thinking about our perspective on consumerism. Finances at their end? What does it matter if you spend? Buy one, buy two, buy three! So cheap it's almost free! Get yours today! What would happen if we all just stopped buying? Could we even do that? Wanting stuff compels us to work, make money, and spend money. Consumers, that's you and me, purchase goods and services for personal use. A lot of them. Americans spend over $1 trillion on non-essential items each year. That's $1 trillion worth of stuff we can live without. So, imagine if we only bought the things we really needed. How would life change? So what's your perspective? Think about your experience with shopping and consuming. Do we spend too much? Why do we shop? Are there benefits to living in a consumer society? Are we too focused on consuming? How would life change if we focused less on material things? Since this topic is one that is so relevant to our lives, we see it pop up in a lot of different media and everyone has a perspective. Let's take a look at this poem from the Explore magazine and collections. As we read, think about what the author's perspective on consumerism is and how they convey this message. This poem is called Shopping Fatigue by Lynette Gwen Kramer. It's important to first understand that the word fatigue means tired. If you feel fatigued, do you feel tired? So we can already get an idea of what the perspective might be from the author just by that title. The idea of being tired of shopping. Look at the background. It says exposure to a daily outpouring of advertisements is a fact of life for all of us, especially online. I don't know about the rest of you, but I can definitely identify with that. Let's see what the poem says. Let the online sales begin. At first, the ads seem to flit about like butterflies. You'll want to see this. Here's our best buy of the week. Check out the daily deals. These deals need your approval. Just what you always wanted. Then the ads spring up like daffodils. What are you waiting for? Snap up the savings. Just hours left. Super save-tacular starts soon. Soon, messages race by as fast as a locomotive. Take action. Simply can't miss it. This sale can't wait. Delays may cost you. Deals can vanish in a flash. Your exclusive savings end tonight. Even as fatigue sets in, the ads stay as constant as a heartbeat. Seasonal sale extended. Act now. One more chance for good values. You can't let these get away. We've missed you. Here's a 30% off coupon. The sad thing was, it wasn't even shopping. Let's go back and take a look at how the author uses language to convey that message of shopping fatigue. Notice that in each stanza, we have some figurative language, and specifically, we have similes. At first, the ads seem to flit about like butterflies. Then the ads spring up like daffodils. Soon, messages race by as fast as a locomotive. 
Even as fatigue sets in, the ads stay as constant as a heartbeat. Each of these uses a simile to describe that experience the, the person is having as they're looking at these ads. In the beginning, it's not so bad. They flit about like butterflies. When we think about looking at butterflies flitting about in a garden or in a meadow, it's not necessarily a negative experience. So the author is saying that the ads just kind of pop up. They, they're around, you notice them, um, nothing too bad. And then they spring up like daffodils. So now we're saying, oh, okay, well, they're springing up like daffodils, like flowers in the spring. And they're kind of nice to look at. Maybe they're attracting my attention. Maybe I do want to um, snap up the savings and take advantage of those hours that are left. But then things start to shift. Soon messages race by as fast as a locomotive. So now I'm getting more ads. The ads are increasing and they're going faster. And it's creating this sort of frantic feeling as I'm looking at them as they're going so fast. And you can see that the ads that are in this section start to get a little more aggressive. Take action. The sale can't wait. The delays will cost you. And then the fatigue sets in and the ads stay as constant as, an, as a heartbeat. So the ads are constantly coming. Just as constantly as your heart is beating, the ads just come and come and come and come. Sales extended. Act now. You can't let these get away. Here's more savings for you. So that use of figurative language and then the use of the examples of what you would see in those advertisements connecting to that comparison that they use in the figurative language really helps to set a tone. And you can see how in the, in the beginning, our tone is sort of relaxed and pleasant. The ads aren't bad. And then as it goes fast to locomotive, things start to intensify. And then after that intense moment, that fatigue sets in, we start to get tired. And then it's just like the ads just keep coming and coming and coming. And then ending with the sad thing was I wasn't even shopping really connects with the reader's experience because how often have we just by watching TV or being on our computer been subjected to these ads that we weren't even really interested in. Here the poet uses very specific language and word choice to convey her perspective on the idea of advertisements and that idea of shopping fatigue. Let's head back to the PowerPoint and explore this idea of perspective a little further. In the poem, the author used figurative language primarily to show their perspective on shopping and consumerism. Another popular technique for expressing a viewpoint is satire. Satire is when humor is used to critique a person, an organization, or even a society. Satire can be seen as sarcasm or as making fun of a person or a situation. Sometimes that critique is very strong, yet satire is widely accepted even by the people who are being criticized. The author Jonathan Swift says, satire is a sort of glass wherein beholders do generally discover everybody's face but their own, which is the chief reason for that kind reception it meets within the world and that so very few are offended with it. This means that we often fail to recognize ourselves in what is being critiqued and can therefore laugh at what we think is a criticism of others. Or maybe we do see ourselves and we recognize that we are worthy of criticism, which can also be funny. We see satire a lot in television with shows like Saturday Night Live and The Simpsons. Cartoons are also a popular way to use satire. Take a look at this cartoon. What do you think is being made fun of? What is the author's perspective? Here we see two people running on a treadmill. One asks if the other is training for a marathon, to which the person responds, no, holiday shopping. We can see that the cartoonist is sharing a perspective about the effort and energy that is put into shopping for the holidays in a humorous way by comparing it to preparing for a marathon. This cartoonist may be critiquing the effort that we put into shopping saying that it's just a little too much. In the try it portion of this lesson, you will be reading an opinion article called The Educated Consumer. This article is a clear example of satire because of the author's use of humor and sarcasm to convey their perspective on consumerism. You will notice some model annotations in the first two paragraphs of the article. Let's go ahead and take a look at those together. The article begins. Have you ever wondered how you can become a more responsible citizen? How you can be a greater contributor of our well-being? Of course you have. 
As some of the most sophisticated consumers in the world, we know very well that the greatest well-being comes from the greatest economic growth. So if we stop here already, we can see some sarcasm being used and contributing to some satire. The author is joking that a person's well-being is connected with how much money they spend. But we know that well-being is connected to a lot more important things than that. Let's continue reading. After all, one of consumerism's basic principles is that the gradual spending of more money for goods and services helps an economy to grow. Here are three easy steps for supporting our economy by becoming a model consumer. First things first, let's talk about employment. With the increasing availability of credit cards, even to minors, you don't need a great job to be a great consumer. However, the better the job you have, the more credit cards will be available to you and the more debt you can incur. So if we stop here for a second, first of all, we know that debt is not a good thing. If we're in debt, it means we owe money. We don't want to incur debt. And yet this author is encouraging us to incur debt, saying that that's what's gonna make us be a great consumer. And if we have a good job, then we'll have enough money and credit cards available to us so that we can get more debt. So this is obviously sarcasm and satire because they're using that humor to make fun of the situation that actually occurs in society, but is not necessarily a good thing. Your job is to read the remainder of the article and to continue to annotate any of the examples of sarcasm, satire, and humor that might contribute to that author's perspective. After you have read and got done your annotations, then your job is to use those notes to answer the questions in the show what you know section. Good luck and may the fourth be with you. Hello, and welcome to the week of May 4th, 7GT ELA Lesson 1, Rally Songs and Rhetoric. In this lesson, you will look at the use of rhetoric in a speech by Old Major in Animal Farm. Part of his speech includes a rally song meant to unite and inspire the animals of the farm. Before we take a look at that specific piece, let's look at another example of a rally song. Rally songs in the United States date as far back as the Civil War and as recently as the Black Lives Matter movement and even presidential campaigns. The 1960s were a particularly important time for rally and protest songs due to many societal factors, one of the most prevalent being the Civil Rights Movement. The song that is featured in your Think About It section for this week's lesson is one of those rally songs adapted and used during this movement. It's called Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around. Let's have a listen to a version of this song performed by Imani Uzuri for the Carnegie Hall Musical Explorer series, and then talk through some of the features. As you listen, think about what the purpose of the song might be and how the lyrics support that purpose. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up that freedom land. Ain't gonna let no jailhouse turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let no jailhouse turn me around. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up that freedom land. This particular rally song was borrowed from a song written in the 20s. The lyrics were changed and adapted to fit the climate of the 60s. Notice that in each verse, there is only one word that changes but each change is as powerful as the last. That one word represents the change that is needed or the oppression that is being faced. We start with, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, but then we change to, ain't gonna let segregation turn me around. 
and then Jim Crow, and then racism, and then hatred, and finally injustice. Each of these words sends a message about the experience of the African American people during this time and what the people are rallying against. Just as important as the change in words is the repetition of words. Each stanza repeats, I'm going to keep on walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom's land. This conveys a tone of determination. They will not stop until they are heard and change happens. The repetition also makes it easy to sing along with, which is important for a rally song. The more people singing, the stronger the message. If we connect these ideas in the song to the rhetorical elements from this lesson, we can see that not only do we have a clear purpose, we primarily use pathos and author style in order to convey that message. Now let's take a look at the rally song featured in Old Major's speech from Animal Farm. This song is called The Beasts of England. Let's listen to a little bit first. Beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, beasts of every land and clime, hearken to my joyful tidings of the golden future time. Soon or late the day is coming, tyrant man shall be off, tyrant man shall be your throne, and the fruitful fields of England shall... Notice that the melody is repetitive and simple, much like Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, but the lyrics are a bit more complicated. Let's see what words are used and how they might convey a message and tie it to our rhetorical elements. He begins with beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, beasts of every land and clime. So what this is is a call to all animals everywhere, not just the animals of Manor Farm. Hearken to my joyful tidings of the golden future time. We see how he begins to promise them a better future, which might appeal to their logic a little bit, thinking that maybe they deserve it. Soon or late the day is coming, tyrant man shall be o'erthrown. By calling man a tyrant, he's creating an enemy. So that's going to appeal to the animal's feelings. They're going to start to feel some anger for the man. And the fruitful fields of England shall be trod by beasts alone. We call them fruitful fields of England. Again, a promise that if beasts alone are trotting those fields, that they will provide for those animals. Rings shall vanish from our noses and the harness from our back. Bit and spur shall rust forever. Cruel whips no more shall crack. Now here we see Old Major really digging into some pathos by talking about the oppression that those animals have faced at the hands of man the rings in their noses, the harnesses from their backs, the bit and spur, and those cruel whips. So if I were an animal and I'm hearing this, it's gonna remind me of any bad treatment I might've had from humans, and it's going to help me feel angry and feel like I need to make a change. Riches more than mine can picture, wheat and barley, oats and hay, clover, beans, and mangle wurzels shall be ours upon that day. Again, more promises, things that those animals would enjoy and love and what they might want to work for and try to achieve by going against the man. Beast. Bright will shine the fields of England, purer shall its waters be. Sweeter yet shall blow its breezes on the day that sets us free. So here we get a little hint at exactly what they want. They want that freedom. And of course, he's alluded to that before, but now we actually use the word free. For that day, we all must labor, though we die before it break. Cows and horses, geese and turkeys, all must toil for freedom's sake. So here, the message changes a little bit. Previously, it was about making sure we knew that man was bad and all the glorious things that, that the animals could have once man is gone. But now, we're showing that we're going to have to work for it and that those animals who are being called to action now might not actually live to see that freedom, but they should all work together. Cows and horses, geese and turkeys, all must toil for that freedom's sake. If they do not work hard, that freedom will not come. 
and the last stanza we see a repetition beasts of england beasts of ireland beasts of every land and clime hearken well and spread my tidings of the golden future time so that brings it all back together and one more final call for everybody the beasts of england the beasts of ireland beasts of every land to come together work together for that golden future So let's connect some of those annotations back to our rhetorical elements. We know the subject relates to freeing the animals from human oppression, and the occasion in this case is Old Major speaking to and rallying the animals of Manor Farm. But we know that the audience is actually a little broader than that, as he indicates with those first two lines of the first stanza and then the last stanza. Overall, we know the purpose is to inspire those animals everywhere to work hard to overthrow their human oppressors and become self-sufficient. We see a lot of pathos being used in this song, which is pretty typical for a rally song. And we see a lot of description, especially when Old Major refers to the equipment used to bind the animals to the humans and the promises of what they can earn if they work against the humans. As we analyze, the word choice is carefully selected to appeal to the animal's feelings and the viewpoints about the humans. We might even see a little bit of the logos in there as he's trying to think about their sense of reason and rationality. Should we be treated this way? And what can we do to work hard to not be treated this way anymore? Now that we've taken a look at the rhetorical devices used in the Beasts of England portion of the text, your job is to read and annotate the rest of the speech. Keep in mind these elements and rhetorical devices as you read through the rest of Old Major's speech to the animals of Manor Farm. How does this song contribute to his overall message? Does including it enhance his message and his purpose? Read the remainder of the speech and complete the rhetorical devices chart. Good luck and happy reading.